You're listening to the Cycling Podcast at the Vuelta a España in association with Rafa. Celebrating the sport and producing the finest cycling clothing since 2004. Today we're in Cumbre del Sol. Oh, it looks so neat. Did you enjoy this landscape, Richard? <laughs> uh, I did. Yeah, well, I enjoyed bits of the landscape today, Fran. Not all of it. Not all of it. Oh. We're, we're on the, the Costa Blanca. This was the this was the uh, party stage, wasn't it? The party stage. Yeah. Well, we went through a lot of um, places with 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 I'm sure parties going on as we were passing Benidorm and places like that. <laughs> yeah. You know this this part of Spain, this region of Spain, is very well known because of its parties and because of its raves. You know. Mm. If you were intending to go engage on a rave during this Vuelta, this was the place to go. Okay, well, I'm probably not going to do that, but <laughs> I was impressed because I drove a lot of the route today. Uh, yeah. Big crowds, mm -hmm. um, not too bleary-eyed. I was impressed by how many people had got themselves out of bed yeah. by early afternoon to watch the stage. But, Fran, yeah. I should say, where are we? We are in a paradoxical landscape of the Spanish property bubble. This is <laughs> this is Benitachel. This is was one of the few towns in the Costa Blanca that hadn't been developed from a real estate point of view until the beginning of this century. And here we are. We can see buildings that are not that are in the middle of works right now. <laughs> buildings that haven't been finished and a lots of roads. Are they going to be finished? Uh, probably not. <laughs> probably not. This is this is the beauty of the Spanish bubble. You know, there are there are some pieces of artwork that are better off when they're finished. Mm. But in the case of the Spanish property bubble, it is better when it is midway. Spain is just works. just a, a, a big work of art, isn't it? Exactly. Well, it was, Fran, we should crack on with the business of the stage. I, I've oh, been yeah. I've been reprimanded on Twitter for oh. for for banning you from telling jokes last night. So I have to give you the, the green light again. You can you can hit us with as many jokes as you like tonight. I don't oh. know if you've got any prepared, but but don't you know don't don't feel that you can't. We're not okay. joined by Daniel Freem tonight because we we my, myself as well, we've got a long drive to Murcia. He's had to hit the road. Um, but we do have a special treat um, if I can call it that. It, uh, the final part of tonight's episode will be well we'll be virtually joined by Lionel Burney. Um who is at home but managed what's that yeah uh, even even on holiday he, well the, the irony is that he was on holiday while he was here but he's working now he's home so uh, um, yeah. so anyway he has been working today and he had a, a long conversation with Jonathan Vauters uh, mm -hmm. who of course owns Cannondale Drap at the team suddenly in trouble and uh, we're not sure if they'll be around next year so a uh, 20 minute conversation with Jonathan Vauters where he, he, he talks through this the current situation mm -hmm. and what the future might hold um, yeah. the, I must, the, I must the, listen in the, my opinion it's a must listen we did listen to it on our way back up the hill here at Fran mm -hmm. Um Unexpected uh, in intervention from John Kerry, former Secretary of State, <laughs> former presidential candidate in the US. So lots of interesting stuff in that interview. Okay. We'll also hear from Joe Dombrowski, the Cannondale Draft writer who's here. Great show by Cannondale today. Um, and we'll hear, who else will we hear from? Uh, Nico Portal. Nico Portal, yep, yep, we will. But I, it's my turn. Sorry, yeah. Fran, you're, st you're stopping me, you're pausing me. Yeah, because I think that you should go on with the tail of the bar. Tail of the tapa, yeah. Okay, <laughs> I'm, it's my turn to do it. So, um, very similar stage to yesterday. In fact, Daniel this morning predicted that it was a stage for Rafael Maica and Julian Alaphilippe, uh, yeah. the same guys as we saw yesterday. That we might just we might just get away with putting out the same podcast again, but yeah. it didn't didn't quite transpire. Like it was a it was a different sort of stage and a different uh, finale. Thanks largely, I think, to Cannondale Drapak, who did a lot of work to bring bring the break back, but. Um, I'd say it was the, the party stage all up the, the, the coast, um, very flat roads generally until they, they got here to the climb, two climbs of the Alto de Puig Lorenza. Is that a good pronunciation? Push Lorenza. Push Lorenza. Push Lorenza. Okay. Uh, the break of 10 were uh, Markel Irizar, friend of the podcast Basque Radio, the Trek Segafredo writer, Mark Soler, movie star, young movie star writer, uh, Marco Haller, friend of Daniel Freib, Bert Jan Lindemann from Lotte NL Jumbo, Tobias Ludvigsen from FTJ. Yes, 
Francis mm. DJ are riding the Vuelta. <laughs> Anthony Turgis from Cofidis. Yes, Cofidis are riding the Vuelta. Uh, Luis Mas, who we've seen up there quite a bit. Uh, Diego Rubio, both from Calla Rural. Can I place a bet now? Mm-hmm. One of these guys is finishing up racing for Movistar team this year. You, get, you told me off for interrupting your tale of the tapa. Oh, s- sorry. But uh, and Connor Dunn. Connor Dunn was there and uh, Ricardo Villela. Connor Dunn, of course, six foot eight, um, aqua blue sport rider who's been really suffering. So it was good to see him up the road today. He said there was a lot of Irish support out today. Um, Jens de Boucher, the Lotto Sudan rider, crashed and abandoned, unfortunately. Um, the break had about three to four minutes, not much more than that. Uh, Cannondale Draft Pack, as I said, really put men on the front. Uh, they were working. A few people wondered whether they were just giving a, a good show, given the, the news, the, the bleak news about the team. But, of course, they were working for Michael Woods, who is a real specialist on this sort of finish. Not dissimilar to Flesh Alone, in a way, you know, just a, a steep uh, a steep climb at the end on the first climb of the Alto de Push Llorenza with 45 kilometers to go Ludvigsen um, Manzana Postebon's uh Vilela and Mass all went clear. Then Soler got across and he and Ludfison went clear. Uh, and the, the gap now was down under two minutes and uh, it all came back together. There was an odd attempt by Roman Bardet to bridge across the leaders after the climb, um, but Sky took over uh, with the gap to Soler and Ludfison below a minute. Uh, you know, they, they obviously, Froome's been after a, a win. And uh, they, they really uh, reeled those two in. And we were standing at right at the bottom of the climb up to the finish, Fran. And we, we saw the, the, the group come past with Sky on the front in, in numbers. Uh, Trek were quite prominent as well. The leaders had been caught by this point And Sky were really driving it. Bardet attacked again. He was caught and then dropped by a young Movistar rider who I must confess I don't know an awful lot about. But fortunately I'm with somebody who does. Richard Carapaz. The uh, Ecuadorian, not many Ecuadorian professional riders. Um, Froome attack then, uh, Chavez and Woods tried to go with them. Esteban Chavez made contact. Woods was just tailing off at that point. Froome went again and he won the stage. And it's the first time this year that he's crossed the line with his arms in the air. Um, I spoke at the finish, we mentioned this already, Nico Portal, the Team Sky sports director. And I asked him about that, whether that was something that Froome was, was desperate to correct the absence of a win this year. Here's Nico Portal. To be honest with me, we never talk about that. Uh, I think it's so focused, you know, on winning the overall. This for him is really important, but probably yes, you know, in in the mind, you when you're a winner like him, you like to uh, to uh, how you said in English, uh, raise your arm. So uh, I think it's something for sure, something a bit, a bit special, yes. In your view, is he going as well or or better here than he was at the tour? You know, it's it's hard. Um, to say that because if I say one thing or another one people public will say but I, I still thinking is I will say uh, it's as good as the tour and in my mind it's, it's even more more stronger uh, at least now on the punchy and really punches and short summit finish so uh, you know he's got a huge engine and uh, he have an easy start of the season and uh, probably the type of rather like type of rather like, like him when you on a top chef or on a good shape and fresh in the tour Normally, you should be able to back up a Grand Tour. That's why uh, team did a, a good training, uh, training with him. And I think now he's maybe on the, on the top, on the proper top, yeah. I mean, there's still a long way to go. He looks very strong, very dominant. Um, but there are you know, teams with, with one or two riders perhaps still, still up there. Is there anybody you, you fear or you consider to be particularly dangerous? I think we all, all, all the guys here, yeah, be honest, you know. We, uh, we all treat him the same. Um, I mean... Yeah, he's a wrong race, like you said. Uh, but the particularity of this week is like all the summit finish, all the GC contender, they push the same. So it's better to take the second when they are. And uh, then at least you're leading the race and you can have more option. Or you try to attack or you just try to race more conservative and let the other attack. So uh, at least this is a really good position. Nicholas Portal there. I mean, uh, th- these stages are quite unusual. Um Tom Dumoulin won up here, didn't he, in 2015. Uh, these short, sharp climbs are obviously indicative of, of people's form, etc. Et but, you know, could the race have another twist in the, in the final week on longer stages with multiple mountains? Whoever does well on the Cumbre del Sol is probably doing well in the follow- in the Shore del Cati and in the following uphill finish. It's, but when we get to the mountains, then 
it is going to be a completely different scenario because there is going to be a strategy to be played, to a strategy to be deployed, which is something that we haven't really seen well, we so far. No, but, exactly, yeah. but in the middle mountain stage mm. of Castellón and on Andorra, which were two different stages to this kind of uphill finishes. It's a very odd... I'm uh, driving along today and... Uh, Castellon, where we were, I think about a week ago, is is pretty close again. We're we're not we're not traveling in a in a line around Spain. We're sort of zigzagging, um, exactly. and it, it's very disorientating. We're back near Valencia now. Exactly. This is this is not a vuelta. We intended as a cycle, rather than a sneak going from Diputación to Diputación. <laughs> the sneaky Grand Tour. Yeah. yeah, we're sneaking our way around Spain. It's yeah. very, very odd. It, it, normally, you have a sense of, of a journey, of, a, of, of traveling, leaving places behind yeah. and, and going to new places. And we don't have that here yet at all. Um, it's, yeah. it's strange. We, I mean, uh, so far, we have been driving in circles for far. In a week, maybe. we're going to be in Granada. Granada is yeah. only about, what, 250, 300 kilometers away. Yeah, it's a exactly. three hours drive, exactly. So it's very, very odd. I don't know how it's going to take us a week to get there, but okay. yeah. <laughs> a rest day tomorrow helps, of course. Now, Fran, when we were waiting at the bottom, uh, the young movie star rider Carapaz attacked and went yeah. clear. Well, he bridged up to Roman Bardi and then he dropped Roman Bardi. You were getting a lot of messages on your phone yeah. about this because you were quite surprised. I must confess, he's a new name to me. Although, looking him up, he's 24 years old and he finished second in the Route de Sud this year, which is a very good ride. He's had a few good performances this year. But you know him because he rides for, he rode for the under-23 team that you're involved with. Is that correct? Yeah, you know, to disclose everything to you, dear yeah, listeners... Yeah, we, tra- we want transparency here, Fran. Yeah, transparency and accountability. I am the communications manager for Equipo Lizarte, which is an under-23 team. It's understood as some kind of unofficial feeder team to Movistar. I mean, there is no official relationship, but a lot of riders from our ranks do join Movistar team. For example, in this world that we have four Movistar riders that have been racing for Lizarte previously, which are Jorge Arcas, Antonio Pedrero, Mark Soler, and this guy, Richard Carapaz. Richard came in last year. He only raced for, with us for one season. He had already had a long experience, a long spell racing with pro riders there in Ecuador and also in Colombia because he lives near the border and therefore he has done more Colombian, more of a Colombian racing schedule than an Ecuador one. As soon as he got here, he proved to be a very solid climber. And uh, and because of that, Movistar didn't hesitate to bring him on board. He was a stagiaire last year, and now he's doing his first full season as a pro. Route to Sud was for sure his marquee performance, but he has been impressive all season long because he is very consistent. And the only, you know, the main... Thing to correct is his way of riding because as we could see today at uh, the Cumbre del Sol, he's very eager. He's always attacking brutally and that leads to him creating very big gaps and lo- uh, quite soon and losing them <laughs> as that soon. Yeah, okay. I mean, well, easy to criticize, isn't it? But that was impressive that he was getting away even from that group when they were you know, riding with Sky on the front, mm-hmm. trying to set Froome up for the win. Yeah. They weren't letting anybody go away. Um, I thought he looked very impressive. You were, you seemed to be surprised that he was that he was getting away, but he looked good. He, he was smooth. Could be a peddler de charm. Who knows? Yeah. And I do have two extra small t-shirts to get rid of, and he looked yeah. quite quite, <laughs> quite a compact chap. Yeah, he, he, that would fit him for sure. You know, he. T- I was speaking to him after the finish line, and he told me that he was actually a bit surprised uh, of how good he is feeling because. He began with a crash before the Vuelta, so he wasn't feeling quite great. But as the days have gone on, he apparently has healed, and he's feeling great legs. And that, and we are talking about a guy, of chap, that he's nine days into his maiden Grand Tour. So if he can, if he gets even better, we may see, we may see him during the second week doing great rides. One to watch. And finally, from the tale of the Etapa today, uh result that or a performance that, that caught the eye for the wrong reasons uh, Simon Yates um, who has looked the least strong or the least in form of the three Orica Scott in inverted commas leaders um, he lost 10 minutes today uh, so he's certainly out of the overall picture and uh, leaving Adam Yates and Esteban Chavez to lead the Orica charge The Cycling Podcast is supported by Science in Sports 
Science in Sport, fueled by science. Thank you to Science and Sport for sponsoring the Cycling Podcast. Uh, you can get 20% off all your Science and Sport stuff at sciencesport.com with the code CPAUG20. Um, we heard the other day in our episode from Hayden Groves, who carries on riding his third Grand Tour of the Year one day ahead of the, the riders. Our Kilometer Zero tomorrow morning will feature Hayden talking through his Giro, his tour, his Vuelta so far. He's also writing a a cookbook because he is a, an award winning chef I think he was national chef of the year in 2013 in the UK mm. and uh, he's basically writing a, a book that's going to come out in November with a recipe for each stage for each Grand Tour lovely idea and while he's been riding the race he's been, he's been trying to eat well as indeed <laughs> do we um, so that's Kilometre Zero tomorrow uh, our Kilometre Zero on Friday was uh, on the broom wagon Tales from the Broom Wagon uh, here's a little trailer from that now Listen to Kilometer Zero, our morning show at the Vuelta España, by becoming a friend of the Cycling Podcast at thecyclingpodcast.com. I have a band called the Broom Wagon. I had with Maddie and Anna Sloan. It, it, it doesn't really exist in any other sports, does it? Uh, well, I brought my derail of someone, and I just remember everybody was gone. I was like, now what? But then you find so many fans, and I just gave a pair of gloves to a guy, and he's brought me, brought me to the finish in his own car. I definitely remember uh, there were some cookies in the uh, Liège broom wagon, and we were all just crushing the cookies and everything else we could find. Seems like kind of a depressing place to be. Well, normally we don't say so much. You just think about uh, yeah, what went wrong while you're sitting in the bus, um, and just hoping to get to the finish line and uh, to go home. And every day uh, they call me, call me, hey, come, come inside, come inside, but no. I think that's it's the really last option to go into the broom wagon. It's like going off to jail, you know? I mean, I don't think they do this with jail anymore, but you know, like in the olden days where you imagine a bunch of guys going to jail in, a, in the back of a bus. And a reminder there that to become a friend of the podcast and listen to all nine episodes of Come to Zero from the Vuelta a España, um, go to thecyclingpodcast.com it's just £10 and you are effectively sponsoring us here so thank you for that thank you it's very much it's a bit much. like the new potentially the new Cannondale Drapak business model <laughs> yeah. crowdfunding but no thank you very much we, a lot of you have signed up during the Vuelta and we're very appreciative uh, of that support and we hope you're enjoying not only Clum Zero but all the other French specials that we've produced uh, this year now on the subject of Cannondale Drapak well actually sorry before we get on to that. Uh, another little bit, bit of business from this morning because I was fortunate enough to be in the start village this morning at the stage start. You weren't at the stage start, yeah. mysteriously enough. <laughs> um, in fact, I, I should read out your, your messages to me because it did make me smile. Um, <laughs> here we are. It made well, you smile. I'm not, okay, I was I'm suffering not, at the I'm seat not, of my car. And you I'm not going to read them all because not, not all of them are repeatable for a family audience, but... Um, you, you put in the wrong place in your no. yeah go on say it get your excuses put, out of the way I put the right place but yeah re- okay. re- read them I, I know this can be thought this is a message I'm quoting here I know this can be thought of as bad luck why did Google Maps put Oriella inland instead of in the coast but I feel devastated I can't fail like this yeah. and then another one we'll try to make up for it in the afternoon at the finish and get 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 three riders for our kilometer zero and today's episode. Sorry and thanks for your patience. This couldn't be more upsetting and discomforting. Yeah, oh, it was. Come I on. feel terrible. Yeah, but, you know because I was so happy that I had got a good sleep and I was heading to Oriwella so calmly <laughs> until <laughs> too I, calmly. Yeah, I was. You no, know, but I was so relaxed and then all of a sudden we realized that there were no signs pointing to the starting village. And he was like, but we are in Orihuela. And all of a sudden, we reprogrammed the GPS to find that the start wasn't actually set in Orihuela. This was it was on Orihuela Beach. I have to say, some a lot of the, the stage, official stage starts and finishes are not actually where they really are. Yeah. It's very... It's very confusing. You have to really study the map closely to make sure you're going to the right place. Exactly. And yet, today, we weren't in Orihuela, although yeah. that was the advertised start. We were in a 
beach nearby. Yeah, Campo Amor, which is the place where Alejandro Valverde goes on holiday. Well, it is Alejandro Valverde land, isn't it? He's he lives he lives around there. Yeah, no, it's, it's Murcia. like a, 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 he lives Near in Murcia. Las Lumbreras, which is like a half an hour drive from ah, there to Campo Amor. Half an hour isn't that far to go on holiday, is it? I mean, uh, it depends. I live that, in the seaside. <laughs> if I go half an hour away, then it's like a huge trip. <laughs> <laughs> I would like I'd be like me going on holiday to Croydon or something. But anyway, um yeah, I, in in Orihuela, well not in Orihuela, but in a in a in a beach, beach. not Campo far Amor. from Orihuela, there was an Orihuela resident, Bernardo Ruth, who is uh a, well, I'll call him an old rider because that's what he is. He's 92 years old yeah. and he held the record for the most consecutive grand tours ridden, 12 until 2015 when Adam Hansen broke it. Now Adam Hansen is now on his 19th grand tour. Wow. Um, and I have to say, I, was, I found Adam Hansen sitting in the village just on his own, and he was waiting to meet him, which I thought was, was really nice. It had obviously been set up by the organizers, but it, it was very touching, the, 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 this, this sense of, um, I guess, each respecting the other. And, uh, uh, you know, Ruth, very good rider in his day, 1948 Vuelta winner. He was third in the Tour de France one year as well. Look up some old pictures of him. I mean, you know, the... The bikes in Spain, in particular, I think at that time were were pretty pretty heavy and hardcore. Yeah, were iron, yeah, iron bikes. Um, <laughs> and you know, he yeah, he's a very old man now, ninety two years old. But um, it was uh, it was a real privilege to witness that encounter. And uh, you, you you are it's it's just a, a strange moment. I mean, strange for both of them as well. I'm not sure he was entirely familiar with Adam Hansen and his and his record, um, but it was nice to see. And uh, good on the Vuelta for setting that up and honouring one of its own, one of its old heroes. Um, you know, there was another homage going on today. Another homage. Yeah, more or less. There was there uh, Chris Bookmans, the writer who unfortunately crashed last year okay. in Murcia and suffered some brain damage as a result of that. Yeah. Uh, was following the car today in a the was, so, wait, was wait, following wait. the race today w- in the car of the doctor that actually saved his life. Wow, Lotus Sudal, rider as well. Um, yeah, I heard he was at the start, didn't actually see him. Uh, we were, the journalists who were there, the journalists who, who studied the map properly and, and, <laughs> made, and made it to the start, <laughs> we were, were camped outside the uh, Cannondale Drapak bus, um, waited for a while for riders to emerge. Joe Dombrowski did tweet that he was prepared to give us an interview in exchange for 7 million euros, which yeah. is the amount so of money. you paid him, right? I paid it, yeah. I just signed a cycling podcast check. I said that we'd had lots of friends sign up during the world, so yeah. covered that quite easily. And um, he, yeah, he, he emerged eventually from the bus. Um, the story which we um, talked about last night is that our sponsor has apparently pulled out of back in Cannondale Drapak next year. And uh, it's left a seven million euro shortfall in the budget, and without that, the team will fold. So, various things have happened quite quickly. A crowdfunding campaign has been launched. We'll hear a little bit about that in the next part. But um, Joe Dombrowski, you know, quite seemed quite shaken. A lot of the riders only heard about this yesterday afternoon after the stage. Um, so, and we'll hear Jonathan Vos explain the the circumstances around that later on. But anyway, here. At the start this morning is Joe Dombrowski. In my mind, when I saw that uh, Uran and Dylan had re-signed, it seemed like the future of the team was pretty secure because you would think that, you know, with Uran on a three-year deal to 2020, you would think that, I mean, everything must be locked up and, and we're all safe. And, you know, I have a contract here for next year. So now it's like, what does that mean? And, and I don't know the answer to that. I mean, it's still so early. Uh, obviously, I've been talking with my agent and, you know, seeing what, what we can do. But on, on the team's end, they have to work fast because it's so late in the year that if they don't come up with an answer soon, they're going to lose a lot of riders because we can't afford to wait around for something that's not there. And you get to October, November, you don't have anything and you could be out of a job. And once you're out of a job in cycling it's pretty hard to come back so you know that is potentially career ending and uh you know that's a scary thing to look at when you've got a house to pay for or kids or whatever so it's definitely a stressful situation 
Do you take any comfort from the precedent of your friend, for example, Larry Warbass last year? He was in a similar situation. It was earlier when I am pulled out, but, but he, he eventually, well, he found a contract and he also rode very well in the short term when he, he heard the news that his team wasn't continuing. Yeah, I mean, hopefully, you know, we can make the best out of this. And even, even here in the next two weeks at this Vuelta, you know, I, obviously we all race to win all the time, but it's uh, desperate times, I suppose. So, you know, now, now you're quite literally racing for your job. So maybe we can pull something off. It's difficult. It's, it's sad because, uh, you know, it puts not only you know, 25, 30 riders at risk of, of their careers. But, you know, you're, you look at this organization and there's probably 100 people who, you know, at, the, at this point in the year, if a team folds, it's, it's a lot harder than in, if you know in March to start looking for work. And uh, so I feel not only for, you know, the other riders, and obviously it's stressful for me because I don't know what's going to happen yet, but... Uh, you know, also, this is a big organization, and there's a lot of people with, you know, they have homes and families that they have to support, and they rely on this, and, you know, it's, it could, it could really hurt them, and it could be difficult for them to find something else, I think. How does it affect you, Joe? I mean, do you, um, did, did it get to you? Are you able to block out at least, you know, during the stages, or is something you find that yourself thinking about the uncertainty? Uh, I'd like to say I could block it out, but I almost, I... I'm roommates with Mike Woods here and I told him this morning I don't even feel like I'm at a bike race anymore like I'm more or less just focused on having a job next year and making sure that I get paid and can keep the lights on at home and all that sort of stuff so uh, I think yeah it's it's I'd like to say that you know it's easy to focus on the race and I, I think we will do and that's the best thing we can do because you know, we're here. We're here, and the the best thing we can do is is ride the best we can, and um, you know that's the best defense against if this team folds and we have to look elsewhere. But um, for sure, that weighs on your mind a lot. The Rafa Cycling Club is the largest global community of its kind. Members share their passion for the road through rides, events, exclusive club kits, and racing. Find out more at rafa.cc. Thank you to Rafa for sponsoring the Cycling Podcast. We'll, of course, be doing another Peddler de Charme um, award this week, later in the week, after the rest days out of the way, but keep an eye out. Um, you, you said that we were going to award a Peddler de Charme t-shirt to Richard Carapaz? Yeah? Well, he, he, might, he, might, he might be in the running, Fran. You never know. You can start I, lobbying for him now if you want. I will try to lobby. Before... <laughs> Before the little break there, we heard from Joe Dombrowski. Um, and you made the point, Fran, that Cannondale rode extremely well today. They gave a very good showing. Um, and, you know, that, that was clearly, partly that was, I think, a reaction to the news. They are all, a lot of them are now riding for their careers, as, as Joe said. But also because Michael Woods has been riding extremely well, um, is had a very good chance of winning the stage and was third in the end. So, you know, a pretty good day on the road for them, but clearly... Um, you know, big problems behind the scenes, and yeah. I think the it's, a, it's a, the, the the danger here. The t- time is of the essence, and the danger here is that you know Rigoberto Uran has given them two weeks, but other riders like Michael Woods may sign elsewhere in the meantime. So they may lose a lot of riders, and there aren't an awful lot of good riders on the market this yeah. this year. So you know, even if they save it in the next two weeks they might already have lost quite a few of their better riders because those riders some of them would be crazy not to sign for another team yeah you know had i made it to the start today i would have looked for a radio agent and see his perspective because i think that this kind of the situation is going to affect hugely how the transfer market plays out. Until now, there were a lot of buyers and few talent available. Right now, 
20 odd very good riders are available and this probably is going to change some dynamics for example a mm. team like cycling academy can now create a very solid lineup for the giro d'italia only with kind of the draft that's the israel team only which is the, is the israeli team that's really stepping up yeah. next year yeah, yeah they are stepping up in order to race the giro d'italia next year yeah. which starts in jerusalem they announced recently this they have signed uh, ben, ben herman from yeah. bmc and ruben plaza from morica scott and they were kind of kind of strong as far as I'm aware, to find the experienced, solid, competitive riders they need in order to face and, that yeah, challenge. Yeah, and, and a, right, a team like Aqua Blue that came on last year and, and signed up a lot of available riders, but signed them all, or I think all of them, on two-year contracts. And so uh, there aren't necessarily spots available at that team either. So um, it's, it's a tricky time for a lot of riders um, yeah. and a very sad situation. I mentioned earlier... Lionel Burney spoke today to Jonathan Vauters and we're just going to play the whole interview and, and that will end tonight's podcast there's a lot of interesting stuff in there about ASO, about the role of agents how they really force the issue here which is an, an interesting thing to think about and uh, yeah, lots of interesting stuff about the, the, the business model that cycling has so yeah. um, we'll, we'll hear from Jonathan Vauters speaking to Lionel Burney and then we'll resume Fran in a couple of days when the Vuelta resumes and we'll enjoy our rest day tomorrow I, I don't know what I'm going to do tomorrow, honestly. Probably yes. Yeah, yeah, you do. You're going to go to press conferences. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. If, if you if you can find them. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that that's all for tonight from us, Fran. So we'll see our Cheerios and leave you in the very capable hands of Lionel Burney with Jonathan Vauters. Thanks, Fran. Thanks, Rich. Jonathan, you're at home in Colorado, is that right? Yeah. And what's the last uh, 24 hours been like? Uh, well, interesting. <clears throat> but, I mean, it's not... It's not the last 24 hours, you know. This is this is the last 10 years. Um, I mean, you know, teams are... Or at least teams that have a, a commercial model and, and not sort of a, you know, a background a private backer or government or you know, whatever um, but teams like ours that are sort of predicated on a commercial model are um, you know you, you're you're always fighting for every dollar it, it, it never stops I mean it, it starts January 1st of every year and it ends December 31st every year I, I mean I, I can remember a few years ago um, we had a, a very large I mean this is a number of years ago now but like around you know 2011 time or thereabouts but you know we had um one of our largest financial backers uh our sponsors just about go into receivership or bankruptcy um you know a few days before christmas and luckily somebody came along and rescued the day for them and luckily the person that rescued the day for them chose to honor the contract with us and but that situation would have would have led to the exact same situation that we're in today. So it's it's it's. I mean, the last twenty four hours haven't haven't been fun. Although you know, I'm incredibly encouraged and humbled by all the public support. But it, it, you know, it's not the last twenty four hours that are stressful. It's it's the last ten years that have been stressful. So what is the situation, and, and when did you discover then that this sponsor that you had lined up had pulled out? Friday morning, um, Friday morning, and the first thing I did was call um, all the agents of the riders, you know, Rigo's agent, manager, whatever, uh, Rigo's, um, Tiro Long's, and Sebastian Langeveld, I, I, I called those guys first, and... Um, Said, you know, I want to let you guys know so that you can start looking uh, for other teams for your athletes. And then uh, I, uh, I, you know, some of them sort of asked me to not go public with it, um, and I agreed to that uh, and, and said, okay, we won't go public with this uh, until you guys have everything where you need it to be. Um, but. I don't exactly know how or when, but somehow it, it, it started leaking. And once it started leaking, I, I just said to them, I'm, I'm really sorry, guys. I, it, it's already coming out, so we might as well just be official about it. Um, and, you know, so then on, on Saturday morning, we, we made the decision to just to formally announce it. 
are you able to say who it is has pulled out and, and what reason they've given you? No, no, I, I can't. I can't discuss that. Um, sorry. What What about the re, What about the reason they've given? Uh, I mean, have, have they just gone cold on the whole whole idea? Is is that is that what it is? Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, listen. Uh, the end of the day, they needed consensus at the board of directors level, not just a vote, but consensus. Um, and you know, even though uh, you know a, a large majority of their executives and leadership team were were supportive, um, you know, you have one person on the board of directors that isn't supportive uh, and with a, with something like this, and and that's enough to derail it. And it was a surprise. I think it was a surprise to them. It was a surprise to us. Um, it, you know, we'd already designed how the buses were going to look and how the uniforms were going to look and so on and so forth. But I, I also understand this because I've been through it a, a, a number of times before. And, and um, you know, a, a $7 million purchase of advertisements, you know, via Google or, or on network television or, or via cable television or whatever, that's just going to get rubber stamped through. People aren't going to question it in a large corporation, and, and it just goes through. A cycling team sticks out, and, and and its job is to stick out. I mean, that's that's the whole point of doing a sponsorship is for it to stick out. But it not only sticks out externally to the public and to the media; it sticks out um, internally. And you know, you get one person on the board of directors that just doesn't like the idea, and I don't know why they didn't like the idea, and I don't know who it was, but. You get one, you know, you get one person like that, and um, it, it falls apart. I mean, they, it, it, I've just this, this is the challenge that a sponsorship revenue model will always have um, is is that you know that it isn't that it is that it's sort of oddball advertisement, and if somebody uh, you know isn't okay with the sort of the out of box thinking that goes along with it, uh, they can kill it. And, 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 you know, 10 years ago, companies didn't have the same degree of, of, um, internal checks and balances. You, you know, they're, they're, they're 10 years ago, you, you had more, uh, ability of just the CEO or the chairman or whatever, just to say, we're going to do this because I love sailing or I love cycling or I love whatever sport it is. Um, but that ability has diminished. You know, after the global financial crisis, um, you know, people demanded, shareholders demanded a higher level of oversight. And, and what that has caused to happen is that decisions have to be made by, your controversial decisions or difficult decisions have to be made by complete consensus and not just majority and not just, um, you, you know, an, an individual deciding to take a marketing risk. Um, it's got to be decided by consensus because nobody wants to risk their job. And, you know, that that, that has made, you know, the sponsorship environment incredibly difficult, um, you know, since then. So the shortfall is $7 million for, for next season. Um, how long have you got to get that together? And, and kind of, if there is anyone out there listening to this, thinking that that might be the sort of um, sponsorship that would interest them, I mean, what, what do they get for that? And have you got any uh, figures that demonstrate how much it, uh, the exposure over a season is worth for that $7 million? Oh, sure. I mean, we, we have volumes and volumes of, of metrics that we, we have sent out and uh, that you know that show that it's an incredibly valuable property. I mean, to be clear, the seven million dollars we're looking for, you know, we are extremely blessed in that because of Oath and because of Cannondale and because of Draypack, um, we have a pretty good amount of funding sitting there in the background, waiting, waiting to be used um, if somebody chooses to step in and and be the first name of the team, you know, f- for that last piece of the puzzle. Um, so that's what they get is the first name of the team. And, you know, do the marketing metrics work? Of course, if you're looking, you know, from a brand recognition standpoint, uh, <laughs> you know, you, you're, you're getting over a hundred million dollars of value from that seven million. Um, now, you know, does that convert to direct sales and ROI? It's harder to follow that path through the forest. Um, 
but you know, for a company that's looking at it from a, either a brand recognition or a sort of a, a rebranding or a re-imaging or you know, you are trying to put a more positive light on their image, uh, that it, it, it's incredibly effective. Um, of course, you've got to find the right company that has global interest. Cycling, if you go to any one country other than France. You know, any one country in the world, you know, cycling isn't, or maybe Belgium, the, you know, the number one sport or the most visible sport. But the thing that's beautiful about cycling is that it's, it's, it's got a very high degree of visibility everywhere. Is it popular in Australia? Yes. Is it popular in Italy? Yes. Is it popular in the United States? Yes. Is it popular in Colombia? Yes. Is it popular in, you know, in Japan? Yes. There's, there's no other sport that, that hits every single country. You know, most sports have a, a really, stronghold in certain parts and then there's kind of a disinterest in other parts cycling it covers everywhere in the world but you've got to have a sponsor that also wants to be seen you know at everywhere in the world so how long have you got to get it together i've seen that rigoberto Uran has said that he's going to give the team two weeks uh, he's obviously in one of the riders who's in the strongest position because having finished on the podium at the tour he is going to be a very valuable asset for somebody. Um, I've seen sure. I've seen you say on Twitter how grateful you are to him to for giving you time because he could just start negotiations this afternoon and, and probably come up with something next week. Um, but how long do you think realistically you've got to get it together? And um, what's the situation with the crowdfunding? Um, are, are you able to say what kind of response you've had so far? Well, so starting with Rigo. Uh, incredibly generous of him to wait two weeks. He could obviously sign a contract this afternoon if he wanted to with any number of teams. Um, our deadline, you know, if you look to last year, uh, what was it? The Lamprey, which turned into TJ Sport, which is a Chinese backer, and he pulled out at the last minute, and they didn't actually have a sponsor. I mean, UAE came in the 1st of December. So obviously, you could leave these things incredibly late. Um, and, and, and work it out. Um, I don't feel that that's necessarily fair to the riders. Our, our deadline is less to do with UCI deadlines and, and paperwork and so on and so forth and more to do with being respectful of, of you know, allowing our riders to have an opportunity, um, you know, to go pursue their business elsewhere. Because imagine had had UAE or TJ Sport or whatever we're going to call it, like had that sponsorship not come through on the 1st of December last year, there would have been no recourse for anyone in that organization. I mean, they, they, it would have just all of a sudden, nobody would have had any jobs and it would, it would just completely die right then and there. So so our deadline is, is, is more out of respect for the riders than it is any sort of hard and fast deadline. Um, you know, of course, we'd, ideally we'd get this done in, in the next two weeks. Um, that's probably also the most realistic because right now there's a lot of buzz about this. There's a lot of um, positive energy about this. There's a lot of public response. Um, and hopefully some sponsor or some individual sees that and, and, and really wants to be a part of that positivity and, and, and um, will, will want their brand to, to be associated with that. Um, so that, that so that's what we're hoping for. A month from now, two months from now, the reality is, is you know, we, we live in a, f- a fast-paced world, and, and most of that will have sort of worn off, and people have, will have moved on to the next story. Um, so uh, while our deadline isn't set, I think it needs to happen in, in the next couple weeks um, to, to realistically go on. And, um, and crowdfunding, crowdfunding. yeah. Yeah, so the crowdfunding, uh, the response has been unbelievable. I, I, I mean, I don't know... Uh, you know, there's a three-day period of acceptance on, on Kickstarter, so we're in that, we, we've, you know, put our proposal forward and, and we're waiting to hear back from them as to whether they'll accept it. Um, you know, this is obviously different than a charitable cause. This is, you know, a professional sports team. Um, but we have allowed people to register their interest, um, and I will say that I am I'm blown away by, um, by the level of interest. Um, I, I, it's you know it, it's uh, it, it's incredible. Um, so uh, so is it is it feasible you know, that it might be it might be that you you could uh, you could even um, cover this shortfall with uh, a crowdfunding effort? Uh, I don't 
don't know. I, I really don't know. I, I don't know the answer to that yet. Um, I mean, I, I think, you know, probably more realistically, it's a little bit of a hybrid solution where, you know, a big player comes in and says, I'll do half if, you know, if everyone else says they'll do half. I mean, we, we already... Um, have had a you know a longtime friend of the team and, and uh, you know somebody step forward and say that he personally will write a one million dollar check. That's already happened. Um, so you know six more to go. Um, we've got you know we've got we've got uh, I mean John Kerry, um, you know our old Secretary of State is I, I think he's 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 working on this like he's a full time sponsorship salesperson for me. Um, we've got, you know, some very high profile people in Silicon Valley that are taking this on with an incredible amount of passion and hopefully I'll be able to, you know, reveal their names fairly soon. But there's a, you know, there, there's a very real possibility um, that, that, that this gets pulled off. Um, but I hope, you know, when it all does, that, that uh, we'll also have a sustainable solution that, that comes along. Um, and, you know, that sustainable solution has to, has to come from, you know, corporate sponsorship. And listen, I mean, clearly in the sport in general, you know, there's also a sustainable solution for this not to happen to any team. You know, last year you could have had three World Tour teams that disappeared. You know, in the end it only ended up being two and one of them survived by the skin of their teeth and so on and so forth. But this year you've got one at risk. You never know. Maybe there's another one that we don't even know about yet. But if you know, it, it's a it's it's a, a ludicrous situation for for a sport to be in. And you know, there is a party that can change that, um, and they choose not to. So you know that that's you know I, I, I won't get too far into that because that doesn't really help anything short term. But but you know if if we get rescued. And I hope we do, and, I, and, and you know, I'm actually pretty optimistic that we will. You know, I, I really think that everyone needs to step back and, and start thinking about how to, how to prevent this from occurring over and over again. We talked to you last year, Jonathan, about uh, the future of the sport and the precarious nature of the, of the business model. So I'm assuming that you're referring there to, to ASO, really, as the, as the biggest uh, revenue generator in the sport and also the, the fact that there isn't a great deal of, of revenue sharing going on in terms of uh, the money that comes into um, ASO as a, you know, in sponsorship and TV rights and, and what have you. I mean, but that's probably a, you know, well, it's an ongoing debate. It's one that's been going on for, for years. Um, you know, yes, when, when yeah. the people who have got everything fixed and sorted, you know, big teams or, or teams with long term sponsors or what have you, um, you know, they don't, they don't tend to want to rock the boat about the business model when, right. when they're secure. It's only really when people are at risk of um, slipping out of the sport that suddenly um, the issue comes to the front of their own own agendas so there needs to be some kind of collective of collective bargaining type uh, approach I guess for with all the teams um, all the teams getting together almost to, to ensure that uh, you don't have a situation where uh, somebody can just pretty much go to the wall three four months before the end of, um, of a year yeah I mean listen I, I mean this has been front of agenda for me for a decade um, but and then, and like I said, I don't want to go too far down this rabbit hole because it's, it's nothing that's going to help us out short or even medium term. But, but it is something that needs to be reexamined. I mean, I'll give you an example of, of let's forget about revenue sharing for a minute. I'll give you an example of sort of how this house of cards, you know, goes is, you know, you'll, most of our sponsorships are, you know, are contingent upon a, a world tour license, which is really, what they're really saying is it's contingent upon Tour de France entry, okay? So, you know, how I've talked about that we have a large amount of money already sort of there, and it's contingent upon, you know, this last title sponsor stepping in. Well, you know, it goes like this. In order to guarantee entry to the Tour de France to fulfill those contracts, we need a World Tour license. In order to get a World Tour license, we have to build a team to a certain level and a certain structure and a certain extent, so on and so forth. Without that, we lose. So it's like, all, you know, the millions of dollars that we have from other sponsors that are ready and ready to go, all of that goes away as soon as we aren't able to enter the Tour de France. So this, forget about, 
the revenue sharing for a minute. The fact that there is not a permanent position, a franchise position for teams um, that participate in the Tour de France, that's the biggest limiting factor. Like, the whole House of Cards is built on that one thing. And ASO know that. And they like to keep it unstable. They want it unstable because they they get to dictate the show because everyone, you know, scurries around, um, you know, not wanting to upset them and not wanting to rock the boat. Um, but it's a really simple piece of the puzzle and it isn't even actually asking them to share share their money. Um, it's it's asking them to, you know, to basically to share the the, the build equity of the Tour de France. Um, so that's whatever, but that's a different topic for a different day. I mean, this, this, this is, you know, the here and now is, is more important. And, you know, the here and now is that we need to, we need to find, you know, a, a brand or an individual that, that want to be associated with, you know, the, the passion and goodwill that, that clearly exists for this team that I'm even surprised by, by how, how much there is. Well, talking of the here and now, your team have been all over the front of the peloton, the Vuelta today, um, still chasing down the breakaway as I'm, I'm watching here on TV. Um, I mean, you, you must be really heartened by the reaction of, of particularly the riders and the staff to um, to be able to go on and, and, and put themselves out there when they probably feel pretty un- insecure and, and deflated themselves. Yeah, I mean, I'm very heartened by that. Um Listen, our, our organization, from top to bottom, we have really great people, um, and that's what makes it work. Um, you know, <clears throat> do we have the most and the best and the biggest and so on and so forth, material and money? No, not, not anywhere close. But our people, um, I don't think you'll find another team with a level of intelligence, the level of kindness, the level of... Um, you know, compassion and friendship. Um, it's not just the riders; it's it's just everyone involved, and and and, it, and it's been that way for a long time. It's 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 um, you know, teams always talk about a family atmosphere, and so on and so forth, um, and that's all well and good. You know, when you're winning races, and you can say it's just like a family, and of course, you know, it, but the test of a, of, a, of a real family is when things aren't going so well, and how. You react there, and, and we all know that from our from our true families at home. That those are the people that support you when when things have really gone wrong. And if you look at the way that our staff and riders are reacting, you know you can see that these these people deeply care about the organization and about the other people involved. I, I mean, I can't, I honestly couldn't believe what I read from Rigo this morning that he was willing to to wait two weeks to see if I could figure it out. I mean. I don't, a guy who just finished on the podium in the Tour de France, I don't think, he, you know, most of the time all we're reading in transfer markets is, is, is riders complaining about their current team because they want to go up to another team, you know, for more money and this, that, and the other thing. And, and here's this guy stepping forward with a team that's on the on the precipice of bankruptcy saying, I'm going to stick around and support these guys until it's absolutely not possible anymore. Like that's a, I, I just think that that speaks volumes about, you know, the, the, the people in, in slipstream sports and that Cannondale trade back. 